Good evening, everyone. Just waiting for everyone to funnel in and we'll get started in a few moments. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Northern Alberta Sport Fishing Regulation Changes webinar. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. My name is Alyssa Robb, and I'll be your facilitator for tonight's session. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you tonight from the traditional territory of Treaty 8. Tonight's webinar focuses on Northern Alberta and the traditional territories of Treaties 6, 8, and 10. As we are coming together tonight online from across the territories and homelands of many Indigenous peoples, I'd like to acknowledge all treaties in the province, as all of Alberta is treaty land, and the long history and deep connections that First Nations and Métis peoples have with this land. I honour this today in hopes of working together in a good way, and as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on. You see on the screen that tonight's session includes both the Northwest and Northeast regions of the province. This year, the sport fishing regulation changes proposed happen to primarily arise in the Northwest region. As such, the presentation tonight focuses on water bodies in the Northwest, but we do have a number of fisheries representatives with us tonight from the Northeast region, so that we are able to answer any questions that we get about all of Northern Alberta's fisheries. To share tonight's agenda, after a few housekeeping items, we will complete our welcome and then move into a presentation from senior fisheries biologists in the North region on Northern Alberta sport fishing regulation changes. At the end of the presentation, we'll move into the question and answer portion of the evening, where we'll be happy to answer your questions until the meeting adjourns at 8.30 p.m. Tonight, we'll be using the question and answer tool on Zoom. On your screen, you should see the Q&A button shown. Depending on how you're joining the call tonight, this button might be hiding somewhere else. It could be at the bottom or top of your screen, along the side on a tablet, or as an option within the Zoom app on your phone. In the Q&A tool, you can add questions about fisheries management in both the Northwest and Northeast regions that you'd like to see answered after the presentation is over. As questions are added, you'll be able to view them and have the opportunity to upvote using the thumbs up like button that you see pointed to there on the screen. If you'd like to see a certain question answered, please give that button a click to help bring it to the top of our queue. As our time is limited tonight, this will help us to ensure we answer your priority questions. And while we appreciate all questions, please understand that we might not get through all of them in this session. At the end of the evening, I'll share alternate opportunities to find information and have your questions answered during the overall sport fishing regulations engagement. Our question and answer tool tonight is carefully managed. Uh, our first and most important rule is to please keep it clean. I'm sure we won't have a problem here tonight, but please know that we do delete any inappropriate content. Questions similar to those that have been answered will be dismissed, and we'll be making an effort to group similar questions together. When you registered, you had the option to pre-submit a question. Uh, we'll be answering a few of those at the beginning of the Q&A session as well. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our presenters and panel for the evening. Uh, we have a team of four presenters from different areas of the North tonight. They are Chris Briggs, Miles Brown, Mike Blackburn, and Adrian Mankey. Later on during the Q&A, in addition to our presenters from the Northwest region, We'll be joined by Kate on Wilcox, Christy Wakeling, Carrie Rudneski, and Ryan Green. Carrie and Ryan are here on behalf of Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Services and are joining us from the field tonight. So we won't be seeing on the them on camera, but they are here to answer any questions that do come their way. As I mentioned, our Northeast region is also represented here tonight on our panel and ready for your questions. Those team members are Jordan Walker, Dwayne Laddie, and Marcel McKilo. We also have a team of engagement and education specialists helping us to ensure tonight runs smoothly. That's myself on facilitation and my colleagues, Rob Harris, Jenna Curtis, and Natalie S. Olson working away in the background. You won't be seeing on them, them on camera either during our Q&A panel, but we thank them for their support here tonight. With that, uh, I'd like to pass it off to our four presenters for the evening so they can take us through the presentation. All right, thanks, Alyssa. Uh, so I'm going to start us out tonight. Uh, my name is Adrian Mayanka. I'm the senior fisheries biologist um, based out of Grand Prairie. Uh, before we get jumping right into it, I wanted to take some time to set some context of why we're all here. And before I do that, I want to thank you all for joining us today in this quite intimate setting. No mask. We can see each other's mouths. 
And and we really want to talk about fisheries manage, fisheries management in the north, specifically some rate changes and some assessments as have happened in the northwest. We will after setting the context of why we're all here, then we'll uh, we'll transition into discussing water body specific regs by district. And the districts we have here tonight is uh, we'll start off with Slave Lake, transfer over to Peace River, over to Edson, and then we'll finish back with myself and GP. When we present, we're going to present two, two groups of regulation packages. One is a notification item and one is a consultation item. I will take some time in a few minutes to describe in detail what those mean. But before then, let's talk about the fisheries management system. What is the fisheries management system, you say? It's a, it's a, it's a process in which we allocate fish. It allows us to create a priority system. The number one priority for us is ensuring there's enough fish in the population to make more fish. We are concerned with the overall densities and the biodiversity within these lakes and water bodies. Uh, the second, once we've fulfilled that first priority, there's enough fish to make more fish, any surplus fish then go to the next priority user. And we want to honor our indigenous fishing rights. Any fish surplus past that will then go to our recreational and then lastly, our commercial use. Our primary commercial use today is, is pr predominantly commercial fishing events and guiding services. So how do we do that? How do we allocate these fish throughout across those different priorities? Well, it starts with good information. We need to understand our fish communities, number one. What does that mean? Well, what species are there? What's their status in terms of how many are there? What is the size distribution, the age distribution? But in order to get that good information, we need to use standardized methods. And fisheries management over the decades of operation is continually evolving their scientific knowledge and understanding and using this to to develop standardized methods. And standardized methods are based on what we've done here in Alberta and from jurisdictions beyond. We utilize this information, uh, sorry, we utilize this information to help us make decisions, but we don't stop there. We also bring in the public. We talk to folks with stream side, lake side. We set up uh, open houses to, to pass that information because we're interested in how the public is, uh, is interacting with our fisheries and what is their experience like. So we can pull all those da data streams together and hopefully make the best management decisions possible. So where are we in the fisheries management? You can think of it as a circle, as a cycle, and it goes round and round. So where are we today? Well, previous to today, our biologists that are presenting today have gone through the assessment as on the top of the circle. We've done the diligence to go put in the nets and, and, um, and gathering the data, analyzing that data, bringing in all the pieces and different data streams that we have and, and developing regulations and um, some recommendations. So today, we are at the engagement uh, portion of the cycle, and that's why uh, you folks uh, have come in to 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 partake in this this portion. And one of the things we're asking as we move forward is some of the follow throughs after this this webinar session is uh, potential online surveys to give us that feedback. Now, as promised, I was going to give you a description of notification versus consultation items. By district, each bio is going to group up the regulation, regulation changes Sorry, by these buckets. First is notification. Notification is really where we have uh, changes to sport fishing regulations that are recommended, and they're due to address conservation concerns. So in general, that is usually lower densities of fish, and there's not a lot of options in terms of regulations that we could put forward that would help us maintain our number one priority is that biodiversity and overall fish to make more fish. When we see populations that are in a stable form, maybe not the highest, but in a stable form in their surplus, we look at um, options for harvest, and that's the consultation piece. These are the proposed items that we at Fish and Wildlife are really looking for feedback from the people here today uh, when they go online to provide those surveys. We will then take that information and try to make the best management decision. So for a sneak peek in the lakes that we will discuss today, again, by district, um, we're going to look at in the notification side, Lesser Slave, uh, Lesser Slave Lake tributaries, Wadland Lake, God's Lake, Talbot Lake, Shining Bank Lake, and the County Sports Bike Pond. On the consultation side, we have Lesser Slave Lake, Wadland Lake, Minnow Lake, and Smoke Lake. 
each of the uh, us bios will take some time to try to bring us all up to speed where we're at with each one of these items. And without any further ado, I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Miles Brown, to take us through the Slave Lake District items. Off to you, Miles. I appreciate that, Adrian. Thank you my, very much, everybody, for taking some time to come out here this evening. Uh, Adrian, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Uh, so as just described, uh, we're going to run through a couple of pieces here that are notifications on Slave Lake. So they, these are situations where uh, the overall abundance of fish is uh, below the desired state, sort of middle of the road, moderate abundance, where our number of options and opportunities are now low, and we need to take action uh, in order to promote recovery, get back to that place where we have surplus fish to allocate uh, to all the user groups that want to want to utilize that fishery. Uh, on Lester Slave Lake, Northern Pike uh, are at a very low abundance, uh, which in our Fish Sustainability Index, or FSI, uh, corresponds to a high risk to sustainability status. Uh, fortunately, uh, for Pike and Lester Slave Lake, we do see a broad, uh, so quite a wide age and size structure. Fish can grow old, fish do grow big. Uh, however, at this time, the number of pike in the lake is really low. Uh, that is a bit of a product of historical management choices where uh, slave has been managed to allow for the maximum uh, opportunity to harvest pike uh, across multiple user groups. Um, but since 2014, uh, when we did the last angler survey, we have heard from anglers that, uh, recreational anglers, that there is a stronger desire to see higher catch rates, continue to see more and bigger fish. And we recognize in order to actually achieve that, we'll, we'll need to take uh, a recovery action following our recreation management framework uh, to see that abundance climb. Um, again, as the graph here on the bottom right hand side sort of indicates, uh, the bottom of the graph is size, uh, the, the vertical axis is the number of fish. What the red line indicates on this graph is sort of an ideal population, a middle of the road uh, fishery. And so our desire for lesser slave lake ultimately is to go from the colored lines you see at the bottom, where again, we, we do get a broad size structure, which is advantageous, uh, and increase the abundance of year classes in, uh, in the lake. With the size of Lesser Slave Lake, we know that that's something that will take some time. And the means by which that we would do that with respect to recreational fishing is to go to catch and release. So the opportunity to angle uh, those fish, take pictures of large uh, quality and trophy pike will remain, uh, but we are limiting harvest opportunity on those fish for some years while the recovery happens for, for density essentially to go back up. Uh, next slide, Adrian. And in alignment with that, uh, so we've, we've just seen some data, we're talking about Lesser Slave Lake. We also recognize that it, it's a significantly sized watershed. There's pike present in some of the river systems that people utilize, but overall, we expect that, that pike, again, are in a difficult state in many of those contributing watersheds. So we will be moving all of the contributing river systems for alignment with the lake uh, to catch and release as well uh, to ensure we give them the maximum opportunity for recovery. Uh, so the, the rivers coming in and out uh, of Lesser Slave would share that catch and release regulation. Next slide, please. And the last notification for Lesser Slave Lake that we're going to talk about is uh, designed to increase the uh, sort of simplicity of the regulations in the guide. Uh, so this predominantly affects the east side of the lake. Uh, the Lesser Slave River, which is the singular outflow from Lesser Slave Lake, uh, has a small section from the lake mouth uh, to the weir on the Lesser Slave River that has been historically aligned to the opening date for the lake, whatever that's been. Uh, this is a bit counterintuitive to a lot of the spring conservation closures that we have on flowing waters. Uh, we know in this system, there are migrations of pike and walleye that go downstream into the Lesser Slave River, utilizing back channels in that river, utilizing uh, some of the, the river system you can see on the right hand side of the screen here to spawn, which is great. But then as they're moving back up into the lake uh, after those activities, they're highly congregated in the river system. There is this small section where fishing and harvest can open up on May 15th, ahead of the June 1 opening for the majority of our uh, flowing water systems in NB2 and, and the majority of the flowing water systems around Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, and, and so it uh, presents this opportunity where the, the singular section where fish are actually trying to redistribute back into the lake, they run into uh, angling uh, harvest in this time window. So the proposed regulation here would actually just be to move this section of the Lesser Slave River to a June 1 opening, aligning with the remainder of the river uh, and the remainder of the flowing water rigs predominantly along the lake. And with that, Adrian, next slide. 
So we're going to transition now from notifications, again, places where we wanted to share that kind of information, uh, give folks insight as to changes we're recommending for alignment, reducing red tape, improving abundance of structure, to consultation items. And this is where we would like to get feedback from uh, recreational users on how they wish to see things uh, managed. Uh, this is going to focus on walleye in Lesser Slave Lake and the contributing river system. Next slide. Uh, so the figure on the left-hand side of the, uh, the screen here, uh, similarly with the Fish Sustainability Index, identifies uh, where populations are at in Lesser Slave Lake for walleye. Uh, so the abundance of walleye in the East Basin is currently uh, in the category, moderate risk in FSI 3, sort of middle of the road, if you would, uh, where we wish to see walleye abundance uh, at this time. In the West Basin, uh, we see slightly lower uh, numbers than we do in the East. Uh, we've got complementary size structures. Fish are a little bit younger, a little bit smaller in the west compared to the East Basin. Uh, but overall at the lake level, we're sort of teetering between that FSI 2 and 3. And our desire is to see uh, the lake solely sit within that FSI 3 sort of category. Uh, the intention for Slave Lake through time has, has been uh, sustainable harvest. The current regulations that are on the lake, the graph on the right-hand side, uh, each of those black bars represents uh, a population assessment survey. So there's been six surveys done on Lesser Slave. Uh, in the years 2005, 6, and 7, a, a bunch of regulation combinations were trialed. And the consequence of those was um, peaks and valleys in harvest. On the other side of that, we understood that, you know what, uh, we're seeing a drop and decline here. The current regulations were put in place, and they've allowed the population to sort of hold steady through time. Uh, with the East Basin outpacing the West Basin a little bit. But again, that tension, that desire is to see the whole lake sort of come back up above that FSI 2 line to an FSI 3, where we know the abundance of fish we have will meet the diverse needs of all the users that fish lesser slave. Next slide, please. Uh, so the graph on the right-hand side here uh, kind of gives us a bit of a perspective of what does a walleye population in Slave Lake look like. Uh, the red bars that you see represent the West Basin, the, the black bars represent the East. And again, that dotted line uh, just represents sort of a modeled ideal uh, middle of the road walleye population. Uh, we can see here, we've got some really strong recruitment coming into Lesser Slave Lake, pulses of young fish, uh, predominantly age two and three. Uh, we have fish that exceed uh, 50 centimeters, more larger, older fish in the East and the West. Um, but we have capital to work with here. So even with a regulation of 43 centimeters, fish have been able to grow out beyond that. Uh, and so when we think forward into time and changing a regulation that, that protects a little bit more of the spawning year classes that are present, uh, maybe helps to structure the size uh, structure in a way that recreational anglers favor, uh, we want to build some resiliency in here to say that, you know, as things continue to change and uh, development occurs around the lake, uh, that this is sustainable into the future, maintaining moderate to high catch rates and the opportunity for people to take fish home if they want. Uh, so there's three choices that we're gonna go through here in the next slide. Uh, so the three options that will be available in the online survey that we hope people will take some time to fill out and give us their feedback are, are these three options. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, the harvest of walleye over 50 centimeters. This comes right out of our uh, walleye recreation management framework. It's the default regulation for walleye. Uh, so you can see here in the graph on the right hand side, the bottom axis presents the size of the fish, the vertical axis tells us about the number of fish in each of those size uh, sort of classes. Uh, and the, the grayed out bar gives you a sense of, of what proportion of that size structure would be vulnerable to harvest uh, to take home uh, with that regulation. Uh, so this does fo uh, focus the harvest into the larger fish. It ensures that there's been uh, several years of uh, recruitment and protection for fish to spawn before being vulnerable to harvest. Uh, and we see that we have fish that are making it out to, to quite some substantial sizes. So there's opportunity for people to take um, and, and catch rates will remain high. The second option uh, that's here is uh, a harvest slot limit. Uh, so this would be looking at fish to take home between 45 and 50 centimeters where the, the sort of grado bar is there. Uh, certainly represents a uh, healthy abundance of fish that are in the lake within that uh, size window. Uh, so this would allow the harvest of between about four and six year classes of fish. So if you thought of it as when a fish entered this year class, they'd be something like seven to eight years old, and they would stick around in there till about age 11. Uh, if they haven't been harvested, they would grow outside of that and then remain protected for the rest of their uh, sort of their life with this regulation from, from the sport fishing harvest. 
Uh, so we would perceive there would be fairly little change in the uh, current uh, sort of harvest catch rate. Uh, there would still be some opportunity to handle big fish, uh, take that photo and, and have those fish go back, um, but present you know, still a feasible opportunity to take fish home. Uh, one of the things we would expect to see with a harvest slot limit, again, is it's really narrowing the, the range across which fish can be taken. Uh, is you know the consequences of harvest will probably show up a little bit faster. We would expect dips within those uh, those buckets, and ideally, as long as fish are continuing to go in and fish are continuing to grow through, uh, that would be okay. We'd, we'd be able to sustain that. Uh, and the third option is again a harvest slot, but a slightly larger one. So it focuses on fish that would be 50 to 55 centimeters. Uh, a little bit fewer in terms of what's currently present in the population uh, within that harvest range. The East Basin has got a few more fish in it in that size than the West Basin currently does. Uh, we know we have fish that are coming in behind that that would perpetually grow into this slot. Uh, we would expect walleye to stay in this slot for somewhere between five and eight years, uh, so a little bit longer as, as walleye get older and bigger, their growth slows down, so they'd spend more time in here. Uh, we'd be protecting three to five year classes of walleye underneath the slot limit that would be spawning and contributing to abundance in the lake, uh, as well as the very large, you know, quality and uh, sort of old growth trophy size fish uh, that managed to get on the other side of 55 centimeters. Um, but again, there's, there's the online survey that sees these options here, try to present a little bit of a compare and contrast for people to evaluate how these, these choices might work out. Uh, and then next slide, if you could, Adrian. Uh, so what we get for feedback on Lesser Slave Lake relative to those choices, we're going to apply again to the whole of the watershed. So uh, to look forward to consistency and to look forward to uh, reducing some complexity in the reg guide, uh, what we get for feedback in the lake is what we will apply to the watershed uh, as a whole uh, with the understanding that you know, we'll still be protecting and allowing harvest on those same sort of year classes within the, the fish population, regardless of whether they're living in the river or in the lake. Uh, and with that, I pass the baton off uh, to my colleague, Chris, in Peace River. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Miles. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Briggs, Senior Biologist in Peace River. And like the previous presentations, uh, we'll be going through a couple notification items and a consultation item. Uh, so to start with, we have Wadland Lake, uh, Northern Pike. Um, we did a survey this past uh, fall and found that the uh, population is uh, quite low and at a very high risk to sustainability. There was a, a harvest slot of one pike between 63 and 70 centimeters implemented uh, two years ago at the start of the 2020 season. Um, and you can see uh, on the graph there on the right, uh, the green uh, lines were the last uh, survey in Wadland. Uh, the blue line is the sort of representative lake and uh, the little red lips along the bottom are what we found in uh, 2021. Um, very low numbers, um, well, basically five fish uh, in total captured. Um, so the uh, current harvest slot will be changed to a, a zero possession limit uh, catch and release in order to uh, conserve uh, the, the fish that are there and to rebuild the population to a, uh, the point where we can once again offer a uh, harvest on the species. And next slide. And the second notification, um, this is a little bit uh, different from sort of the, the standard notification where people might think, oh, well, it's being closed. Um, this is Talbot Lake. It's a uh, moderate sized lake to the south actually of, of Wadland Lake and was uh, sampled for the first time in about 55 years, uh, just this past fall. Um, there was good size class distribution. You can see, um, you know, all the different sizes of pike are in the lake. So there is uh, evidence of recruitment, there is small pike, uh, but the numbers overall were quite low. Uh, now, normally this would uh, signal maybe a, you know, a conservation, um, you know, issue. However, uh, Talbot Lake itself is, is quite remote and, and difficult to access. So we do have another option in this case, because the uh, current regulation is uh, three fish over 63 centimeters, uh, changing this to a one fish over 70 centimeters 
offers uh, you know that little bit more protection, a couple more years of uh, potential spawning for fish. Uh, and with the with the general remote uh, nature of this lake uh, and limited access, uh, shouldn't pose too much of a risk. So, if you're in the um, our Northern Pike Recreational Management Framework, this is what's known as a, a passively managed lake. Um, this was uh, a not an easy lake to get into and sample, not something that we can, uh, you know, you know, realistically keep a close eye on. So it would fall into this uh, regulation change. And then we would, you know, go back every, you know, probably 10-ish years and just have a look to make sure that it was still um, a functioning and, and there was still, you know, fish in there for people to have. So, so again, a harvest opportunity still exists. Uh, it's just the, uh, you know, different size and bag limit on this lake. So, next slide. Final notification is uh, on God's Lake, uh, which is in the uh, the Peerless uh, Graham Lake area. For those that might know the area, um, this is case there's no regulation change. It will remain the same with uh, one northern pike over a hundred and walleye with the zero session limit. The one thing that will be changing is the uh, date of the open season will change from June 15th to June 1st. The uh, June 15th date was there to uh, protect uh, spawning walleye in this lake that they you know, thought were to spawn a little bit later. Um, however, that's you know, with uh, some changes in, in the climate and access to the lake that's not really so much the case anymore so there's a little bit more angling opportunity uh it also aligns this lake with uh, the surrounding water bodies for reg regulation simplification so next slide and on to the consultation items again consultation these are the uh, the things that we are looking for your feedback on uh there are options here that are part of the survey that uh, there will be links for uh, at the end of the presentation. So, um, so Wadland's a bit of a special lake. It has both a notification and a, a consultation. In this case, the consultation is on uh, walleye species. So the, uh, the graph on the right, uh, the green was from 2016 where Wadland had amongst the highest uh, number of walleye um, in, in their and our surveys, you know, in the province, um, was very uh, at very low risk to sustainability. And then, in uh, five years later, in 2021, so just this past fall, um, well, uh, large decline uh, in the population, as you can kind of see. Uh, the blue line again being kind of what we would expect in um, a representative sort of your, I believe Miles referred to it as your middle of the road lake. Um, so you can see the red, not only, uh, so very low evidence of recruitment, not a lot of uh, small baby fish uh, coming up and a, a very sharp uh, decline at the uh, 50, uh, 500 millimeters or 50 centimeters uh, total length. That's uh, currently the regulation is uh, one fish over 50 centimeters. So uh, there's been a, a fairly large harvest of, of those fish and the subsequent decline in the numbers. So next slide. So Wadden Lake is at a high risk to sustainability. It is still a two on the FSI scale that um, has been mentioned in the previous slides uh, and a conservation-based uh, approach is needed. So we have uh, two options that we are looking for your, your feedback on. Option one would be to um, have a regulation of uh, zero, zero harvest or, or catch and release. Uh, this would main uh, the fastest possible recovery of the species to a sustainable harvest level. Or option two is the use of special harvest licenses. So um, a limited number of uh, special harvest licenses or SHLs would be issued uh, for this lake, allowing for some harvest for tag holders uh, while still allowing the uh, you know, population to recover. But given that there's some harvest, the other uh, recovery will be at a slower rate. So these are what we're uh, looking for your for your feedback on. So again, as I mentioned, it will be mentioned at the end. Uh, please go in, um, indicate your, you know, your opinion on this, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And with that, turn it on to my colleague and Ensign, Mike Blackburn. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, so as Chris says, uh, I'm Mike Blackburn. I'm the senior fisheries biologist out of Edson. And uh, tonight I have one notification to talk about. And it currently, uh, it is gonna address the status of Lake Whitefish population in Shining Bank Lake. Um, Shining Bank Lake is a relatively small lake, approximately 60 kilometers northeast of Edson. And, uh, and based on, or based on our, our recent assessments, uh, we have found uh, that there has been a steady decline since 2004, as we can see in, in the graph on the right. Um, basically what this graph is showing is uh, time along the bottom uh, of the graph and the numbers of fish along the vertical axis. And we've seen about a 75 production in uh, catch rates compared to 2004. Uh, so basically what we think we're seeing at Shining Bank Lake is greatly reduced numbers of spawning lake whitefish. So a decreased proportion of older fish in the catch, uh, which ultimately is resulting in a reduction in uh, lake whitefish offspring year after year. Uh, if prolonged, the situation can lead to a collapse of the lake whitefish fishery at Shining Bank. So to promote recovery, uh, the lake whitefish regulation is going to be changing to catch and release. Next slide, please. So the Edson District also uh, requires consultation on uh, a lake, and this lake is Minnow Lake. Uh, so Minnow Lake is a small lake, uh, 50 kilometers southeast of Edson. Um, the lake actually became a new walleye harvest fishery in 2018 uh, as a result of some stocking efforts uh, back in the 1990s um, and approximately 25 years of catch and release fishing, uh, which ultimately resulted in uh, pretty high densities of large adult walleye by 2016. And we could see this in the graph on the right. Uh, so when we're looking at the graph, uh, similar to the other graphs, we have total length or size along the, the bottom axis of the graph and the number of fish on the vertical uh, axis. So when we're looking at uh, the gray bars here, each gray bar is uh, representing uh, a size category of fish and the height of the height of the bar indicates kind of the number of fish. So 2016, as you can see the gray bars, we, we had quite a few uh, larger fish uh, greater than 50 centimeters. And as a result, uh, uh, we, we were able to manage the fishery with a special harvest fit, uh, our special harvest license or a tag fishery. Uh, so what we were doing, we're, we were issuing small number of class A tags, uh, which the successful applicants were able to harvest two walleye over 50 centimeters. Um, however, when we went back in 2021, uh, completed another assessment. And as you can see on the graph, this, this is the, the darker black bars in the graph. However, we still have some larger fish. Uh, we've seen a substantial decline in the walleye population uh, compared to 2016. And uh, so basically what we're seeing is that natural mortality and angling harvest is greater than the annual walleye reproduction. So in other words, uh, there are more walleye dying every year than are being born. So because of the limited and inconsistent walleye recruitment, uh, the current objective of a naturally sustainable walleye harvest fishery at Minnow Lake is kind of unrealistic. So therefore uh, a liberal management objective is considered more appropriate. So uh, a liberal management objective should enable anglers to harvest these stocked fish with few restrictions. Next slide, please. So to maintain a, a liberal harvest fishery for walleye at Minnow Lake, uh, stocking would be required. If, if stocked, uh, it's unknown if these walleye would be able to successfully reproduce. Uh, however, regular stocking events would be planned to maintain this population and stocked walleye, we, we, we have to, um, like we wouldn't consider, we'd be able to catch walleye instantly after stocked, we're gonna be stocking as fry, like these, these little, little guys on the screen here. Um, and they probably wouldn't reach a catchable size for four or five years and would be managed under a put grow and take objective to allow harvest of these stocked fish. Uh, if we don't stock it, or if we choose not to stock it, uh, a harvest opportunity could be maintained in the short term. So perhaps maybe one to three years, maybe a little longer as the number of walleye harvested will likely outpace the limited annual offspring. So ultimately this could lead to poor fishing success and potentially the loss of the stocked walleye population and the diversified fishing opportunity it provides. Next slide, please. So although the, the newly stocked walleye wouldn't reach a catchable size for somewhere around four or five years. 
the current walleye stocks in the lake could provide a harvest opportunity uh, while these newly stocked fish grow to a catchable size. So uh, harvest options that we have available are uh, one walleye any size or one walleye over 50. Uh, one walleye any size should provide an opportunity to harvest moderate to large size walleye kind of in the range of 45 to 55 centimeters in the short term while the, the newly stocked fish grow to a catchable size. Uh, but in the long term, if stocking is, is successful, the wally harvested will likely be smaller. So kind of in the 35 to 45 centimeter range uh, as wally will likely be harvested as soon as they reach a catchable size. Uh, the one over 50 centimeter option uh, would not be for conservation purposes. Uh, it would be more to, to, to result in a more gradual harvest of the current wally stock. So, um, more equitable sharing, I guess, compared to a regulation of one any size. Um, this option should provide continued harvest opportunities for large size walleye in the short term. So somewhere in the, uh, basically 50 to 55 centimeters. So what we're seeing in, in the lake right now. Uh, so that would be in the short term while newly stocked fish grow to 50 centimeters. In the long term, if stocking is successful, this option should provide harvest of 50 centimeter walleye. And um, that's all I have for tonight. Thanks for your time. I'll now hand the mic over to Adrian Menka, Senior Fisheries Biologist in Grand Prairie. Excellent, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and as the team, as, as the crew is, has started off us tonight, I'm gonna start off in a notification item. I just have one to discuss. Uh, it's a bit of a, a different one. It's a non-native fishery. It's a stock fishery. So this is the County Sportsplex Pond. The County Sportsplex Pond is located in the town of Claremont, Claremont just north of Grand Prairie. Currently has fish, uh, five fish any size. Um, we're proposing to go to a zero possession limit to catch and release and change a bit of the season. And why is that, you might ask? It's, it's due to human health concerns. So let me provide some context. This pond is within a stormwater management system in a heavy industrial area. Um, and you can imagine Northern Alberta, the heavy industry that's up here, has a lot of different chemical requirements to, to ser serve that industry. Unfortunately, in 2019, we experienced uh, a, an illegal dump of hydrocarbon product into a ditch line, which unfortunately made its way down into the pond. Uh, it was reported fairly quickly, and the county who, which, who managed this pond actively, the infrastructure, responded appropriately, had uh, consultants on site, and there's been extensive remediation through the affected zone and a lot of monitoring since then. However, Alberta Environment and Parks, myself, I was a little concerned about the long-term performance of this pond uh, in relation to human health concerns. Uh, would we be able to pick up a contaminant in time to avoid someone getting sick? potentially now so uh, we're not human health we're not human health experts so we went to Alberta Health and we asked them to review the data provide us some recommendations and how to move this fishery forward uh, whether it be how do we address human health concerns into the long run Alberta Health came back with their recommendations in order to do so you can do one of two things one is develop a, a uh, monitoring plan in order to do so that would capture the suite of potential chemicals that could flow in based on accidents or intentional releases is a very large list in order to employ the labs and get all of those specimens it's going to be um, uh, a substantial investment in dollars and resources to monitor this small pond the second option provided by Alberta Health to ensure we, we meet human health concerns is again, fisheries management is not those experts. They said, maybe we change this and we continue with this catch and release concept because the pond was changed to catch and release while the spill and remediation occurred. Um, AAP agrees with that recommendation, same with the county and the ACA who also um, are collaborating in, uh, in managing this pond. Uh, so that's what we propose to, to move forward with. Now the season, closure is a bit of a d you know just some cleaning up households so what happens here is the county doesn't allow any sort of over ice activities on stormwater management ponds so they t they had a sign currently just saying please do not ice fish uh, I am adding it to the regulations so folks don't take any sort of a long drive to get to the county sports blacks thinking they can do some winter fishery. 
So that's the county sports plaques. Now moving on to the consultation items and a reminder, these are the items we're looking for feedback. These are the items that we'll have surveys on. But like uh, I should just highlight at the end of all this, we'll take questions on both notification items, consultation items, and any of your favorite fisheries. But moving on, let's, let's talk about Smoke Lake. Smoke Lake is a approximately eight kilometers west of the town of Fox Creek and is one of the few natural walleye fisheries in the northwestern Alberta. The story of Smoke Lake is interesting. In 2016, we had the third consecutive fish assessment showing a decline in the walleye population. We went from a low risk state to a high risk state over those three consecutive uh, surveys. That is a concern and where we have where we try to manage most of our lakes, like I said at the forefront, uh, through our allocation policy, we need to make sure this fish to make more fish. So our target here is to keep these fish at the moderate risk. So to do that in 2018, I changed the regulations to zero possession limit. And it wasn't just for walleye, it was for northern pike and lake whitefish because they were all showing depressed numbers. We went back in 2020 and thankfully and, uh, we saw some slight recovery. And as we start to get those indications of recovery, we want to come to the public and discuss what our options are. We have slid into that moderate risk category. So let's discuss what we could do here. So we've gone from catch release, a couple of years rest. We've seen some increase, not a huge spike in recovery, but some increase in density. And I, I feel there's a couple options that we could explore. One is reinstating since Smoke Lake was managed with the special harvest license between 2012 and 2017, uh, reinstating that special harvest license and issuing a small number of tags to allow some opportunity to harvest, but still re promoting recovery into the larger size categories. Or we can continue with the zero harvest, maintain catch or release, and we should see a faster recovery. So let's look at that, what that means in terms of populations. If you look on the right side of the screen, as you've seen tonight, there's three time slices of populations. The bottom axis, again, is fish size, and the vertical axis is number. We see 2013, one slice, that's one assessment, 2016, the view of another, and then finally the last assessment of 2020. If I were to overlay the tag sizes across those fish distribution, let's, com let's compare over those years where we saw the fish numbers drop. As you can see in 2013 in Class C, we had a decent number of small fish, that's 30 to 43 centimeters. However, when we uh, sampled it in 2016, those fish seemed to disappear in that category category was highly depressed. We set it to rest in 2018 and since that time we've had a number of uh, 30 to 40 fit 30 to 40 centimeter fish grow into that size category. If the, the public or the anglers of Alberta would like to uh, open up an opportunity for harvest. I'd like to promote that harvest into the larger size category and allow those fish, those 30 to 40 centimeter fish to bleed into that category while we have a small harvest. The, uh, the, the alternative to this is a zero catch limit and this bench strength in the 30, 40 centimeter uh, size class, that class C, We'll have a quicker time moving into the Class B. I look forward to your comments and your suggestions. And at that point in time, that kind of wraps the presentation up. Uh, reminder slide, what we've discussed, both in notification and consultation items. Notification items is ones where there will not be surveys online, and these are more recommendations based on conservation concerns or some general, general regulation alignment. On the flip side of that is consultations. This is where we're really interested in you folks rolling up your sleeves, diving into the survey and giving us your feedback. So when we sit down next to our desks with these information streams, we can really make hopefully the best management decision that not only serves our number one priority, but the, 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 our, the public of Alberta. So uh, on that, thank you very much. And we're gonna move to the question period and I will pass it back to our facilitator, Alyssa. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, so that wraps up our presentation. Um, I'd like to extend a big thank you to all four of our presenters for the information tonight. Uh, I'll now take us into the question and answer portion of the evening. So Adrian, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen there. And I invite our panelists to turn their cameras back on uh, as we prepare to answer your questions tonight. So again, you will not see our Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Services representatives, Carrie and Ryan. Uh, they're out working in the field or our engagement and education team working in the background. 
As a reminder, we'll be using Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, you should be able to see the Q&A button on your screen. I see there's lots of good questions in there already. Uh, when you see a question that you'd like to see answered, please take the opportunity to use that thumbs up upvote button to help bring it to the top of the queue. I see a lot of people have figured that out already, so thank you. Well, you're busy asking questions and upvoting. Um, I'd like to start us off with a few pre-submitted questions this evening. To give our presenters from the Northwest a quick break, we thought we'd capture a few questions about the Northeast off the bat. So the first uh, pre-submitted question, we actually had a similar question come in as well, um, and I'll read them both here. First, the pre-submitted question was from Ed. Why is the cold lake lake trout size limit so large? There are many healthy fish, 65 to 75 centimeters. Over 75, there are fewer skinny fish. And the question asked at the session tonight is from Brody. We can't catch big lake trout in cold lake with the size limit. We need a slot size. You can catch lots of small, but hard to catch, hard to catch keeper size of trophy trout. Hi, Alyssa. Yeah, I'd be happy to take that question. Um, my name is Dwayne Laddie. I'm the senior fisheries biologist from the Cold Lake office, and uh, I'm in charge of uh, uh, monitoring and managing Cold Lake. Um, the uh, lake trout regulation on Cold Lake, the 75 centimeter regulation, was uh, implemented uh, about 10 years ago um, as a uh, recovery tool, um, about 10 years ago or, or, or longer. Um, uh, we were getting, um, we were monitoring the population, um, densities were increasing. Uh, however, as densities increased, we got a, uh, a big um, uh, effort response from anglers. Uh, Cold Lake became really popular um, fishery and uh, we had determined um, based on angler effort surveys that um, that 65 centimeter uh, size limit wasn't going to be uh, sufficient to protect uh, the population, the recovering population. So we increased the minimum size limit to 75 centimeters. Um, that gave the lake trout uh, uh, um, extra time uh, to mature, uh, produce more offspring to increase their numbers. And we have that now. Uh, so we have uh, monitored the fishery um, uh, Lake trout densities, numbers of fish are, are increasing, and so uh, we are um, uh, we are at the time now where we are in a recovery period, and or, uh, we have recovered, and we want to uh, look at options for um, providing more opportunity, more harvest opportunity. Um, so we are planning on um, uh, reviewing, renewing the Cold Lake. Uh, management plan, um, looking at um, regulation, uh, potential regulation changes uh, and the like. Um, uh, unfortunately, don't have uh, anything to present or uh, discuss uh, tonight on Cold Lake, uh, but in the coming months, we will be um, uh, having, uh, there will be an engagement session and discussions, conversations with stakeholders um, about uh, management on Cold Lake. So yeah, stay tuned. It's going to be uh, it's it's going to be great. Excellent. Thank you, Dwayne. We look forward to it. Our next question comes from Richard. It's a pre-submitted question. Uh, what is the current management strategy for Lac La Biche Lake? Oh, maybe we'll jump on to the next pre-submitted question as we just uh, just move along to the next one here. So we'll come back we'll go, come back to that one in a moment. So next pre-submitted question is from Ron. Uh, are you going to open up the walleye harvest on lakes that have recovered, or are all or are still going with the draw system? Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Alyssa. I can grab Ron's question. Great, great question, Ron. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate on Wilcox, Northwest Regional Fisheries Manager. Um, I just, uh, I did have some notes here. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll refer to a little bit, Alyssa, with Ron's question. I, and I hope I'm understanding it, Ron. And if not, uh, you know, certainly follow up. And um, Adrian had some really great slides at the front end that kind of showed that cycle as we go through here. And, and if I kind of got your question right, uh, this is once we went through that recovery phase, you know, where are we at and what are the options are, that are in front of us? 
And, um, you know, if we kind of visualize that, uh, you know, that yellow, that red, yellow, green bar that shows what are, what's the target we're trying to get at, um, and that target being set through this public input process. Um, and once we've achieved that, so we're at that target, uh, what, what is the regulation? Uh, often when we use um, catch and release as a recovery tool, uh, the, the intent there is once we've achieved recovery, that we've got sustainable, uh, sustainable options and sustainable harvest options really uh, kind of going forward. So getting to that recovery piece hopefully unlocks harvest options. Those could be things like a uh, special harvest license or tags. Uh, they could be open regulations, uh, such as a one over 50 regulation for walleye as an example on those. So, um, you know, that's really where the consultation comes in. So once we've reached, once we've achieved that recovery target, uh, really it's, it's identifying the sustainable uh, harvest options. Uh, those are also identifying the, the trade-offs and constraints that, that might be associated with some of those options. And then really bringing it back here. Um, I, I kind of, you know, use Adrian's example on Smoke Lake, uh, those that might've followed that, which is using in that case, SHL as a recovery tool, not just, uh, not catch and release. And once uh, we've achieved that target, um, Adrian's going to want to out with uh, with and, and get public input uh, on is it feasible to offer an open harvest? Uh, is is it uh, uh, an option to continue with SHL in order to again maintain those harvest opportunities that I think most folks are interested in? So I uh, I hope that uh, answered the question for Ron and again happy to follow up. So excellent, thank you for that, Kate. On. Uh, our next question is from the live session here tonight. Uh, it's actually a series of questions from a number of folks on the theme of uh, enforcement. So the first question comes from Jeff. It says, I saw zero enforcement on Lesser Slave Lake last summer. Usually I see spot checks on shore and on lake three or more times per summer. Am I missing something or is enforcement in fact reduced? Ken then also asked a couple of questions here. Um, he says that he knows last year a cabin owner phoned reporter poacher and was told they would have to send an officer from Barhead, Barhead which is a two and a half hour drive and noted a uh, limited number of officers in the field. And Nicole added a couple of thoughts uh, on the topic of Lesser Slave Lake, Lake and enforcement as well. So I open the floor on that, that theme. Uh, good, good, more, good evening, everybody. My name is Ryan Green. I'm the inspector uh, from High Prairie. <clears throat> uh, good questions. Uh, I'll just start by answering. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Service uh, regularly conducts Conducts regular patrols on Lesser Slave Lake. Um, just remembering that there's over 20 main access points on Left Lesser Slave Lake alone. Last year was a, a dynamic year with COVID and uh, the hot temperatures. Uh, that being said, uh, we do conduct uh, enforcement in a, also in a variety of different ways. Just because folks doesn't see don't see us doesn't mean we're we're not there. One thing um, we do depend heavily on the public is uh, their, for their assistance. Uh, reporter poacher calls, uh, we, we, we re rely on those quite heavily. Um, to date, I've been in a high parade since 2014 and I have, uh, uh, I can say that throughout the summers, the reporter poacher call, calls are going down. For whatever reasons we, we really depend on the public to give us a hand in that matter. Awesome, thank you for that there, Ryan. Our next question tonight comes from Ian. Uh, Ray Makowicki's thesis on Seabird Lake well documents the need to open seasons later in the spring, such as June 1st. However, many of our lakes still open on May long weekend which is hard on vulnerable populations. Why don't we change the fishing season to open June 1st to protect the stock? Hi, uh, Ian. Um, that's a great question about, uh, about uh, the uh, seasons for uh, our uh, spring spawning fish. Um, we uh, typically open our, our fisheries uh, on the uh, May long weekend, um, and that's a social decision. Um, it's uh, it's a time of year. It's springtime. Uh, people have uh, got their boats ready, and it's you know it's May long weekend is typically uh, the opening weekend for fishing in Alberta. Um, however, we do have some of our fisheries where we have conservation concerns, and we do um, uh, protect or uh, extend the uh, spring closure. Um, Seabird Lake, um, off the top of my head, I don't think has uh, 
I, I, it's probably open on uh, the May long or May 15. Um, but uh, we could certainly uh, discuss um, changing uh, or uh, delaying the opening um, on some of the fisheries. But uh, that would take uh, that would take some uh, consultation um, as as a uh, uh, as a recovery uh, tool. Uh, right now. Um, uh, Northern Pike are uh, are collapsed uh, in Seabert Lake specifically, uh, so um, there's just zero uh, zero harvest for uh, Northern Pike. Uh, extending a closure for two weeks uh, may uh, may provide a little bit of help, uh, but I don't know if that would be sufficient to recover uh, uh, Northern Pike right now. But uh, interesting question. Thank you. Awesome, thanks for that answer, Dwayne. Our next question comes from Randy. Uh, would the pike numbers actually be caused by overabundance of walleye and not angler harvest? I, I can take a, a swing at that, uh, Lisa. Uh, so th thank you very much for the question. Uh, and you know, the dynamics between species in lakes is certainly uh, something that can give pause that we do look at. Uh, you know, fortunately, on this exact subject, um, our department was able to publish in 2021 in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management. Uh, folks that are interested, you can actually Google this article. It's called, Are Alberta's Northern Pike Populations at Risk from Walleye Recovery? Uh, and so it, it looked at the data set of all of the lakes across the province uh, that have been sampled with our method, uh, you know, our index netting survey, which fortunately now is, you know, 20 plus years of data. And within that, we found that there is very, very little evidence to suggest that uh, high abundances of walleye were having a negative implication or impact on uh, pike populations in cases where there was, uh, you know, very weak sort of linkages. It was typically when uh, walleye populations were at, you know, you know, really quite high abundances. So in our FSI matrix, we would see that as more like the four or five uh, sort of level of, you know, where that density is, is high. And then even at that point, the, what the paper identifies is the consequence of um, vast reductions in walleye do not necessarily have a correlated response in improvement in pike. There's so many other things that can be going on in terms of uh, recruitment survival and, and other pieces. So it is uh, less of a direct teeter-totter like, like effect. The paper goes into a lot of detail on this. Be, if folks are interested, please uh, uh, search that out. And in Lesser Slave Lake, bringing that back kind of to what we see in Slave, uh, we know the walleye population is sitting in that sort of FSI 2, 3 kind of category. So, you know, we are near middle of the road, but certainly not into a place where we would say there is a high or very high abundance of walleye in the lake. Uh, and pike, the, the lower abundance we observe there is again sort of a cumulative effect from a long period of time uh, prior to rec in, in conjunction with recreational fishing. But for a very long time period, there was uh, commercial netting that took place on Slave Lake. And for many years, we saw uh, harvest between you know, hundreds of thousands of kilos and tens of thousands of, uh, sorry, yeah, 18 to 19,000 kilos of pike leaving. So there were times where very significant uh, harvests occurred. And at a population level, we never saw sort of corresponding recoveries from some of that. So um, lots going on over a long time frame. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that answers the question for you there. Thanks for that, Miles. Uh, so we're going to circle back now to that pre-submitted question that we had skipped there at the beginning. It came from Richard, and the question was, what is the current management strategy for Lac Labiche? Hi, I'm, I'll be glad to take that one. My name is Marcel Maculo. I'm senior fish bio out of Athabasca. Uh, thanks for the question, Richard. Uh, the management strategy on Lac Labiche, they're specific, they're species specific, and they depend on the status or risk sustainability, as well as the uh, fisheries management objective. Uh, the FMO for walleye or the fisheries management objective for, on Lac Labiche is restoration, sustainable harvest and the fisheries management objective for Northern Pike is sustainable harvest. Lac La Vish was actually surveyed this fall. And based on those results, we're not gonna propose any changes to the uh, fisheries management objectives or the regulations this year. Uh, the walleye slot limit was implemented almost two years ago. 
And the knowledge that we gained over that time is, uh, is pretty invaluable. It's allowing us to see the effects of the population, both in the short and long term of this change. Uh, the preliminary analysis of the data indicates that there are some impacts. Specifically, the uh, walleye catch rate has decreased uh, from what we observed in 2018 by about 20%. And uh, there's some changes to the length, length distribution of the population as well. Uh, there isn't currently a conservation concern. So we're gonna continue with the regulation for now. Uh, we're gonna be monitoring the lake closely. Uh, we're gonna adaptively manage based on those results. And the next twin is planned for 2023. And if the trend of decreased walleye abundance continues, then we're gonna have to re-examine the feasibility of both the objective and the regulation. Uh, with regards to Northern Pike, the regulation was changed to catch and release in 2018. Uh, the results from this fall have indicated uh, a further decrease in the catch rate, and it puts them into the uh, FSI one or very high risk to sustainability category. So as a result, we're gonna to continue to manage Northern Pike for recovery. So in summary, uh, the abundance of walleye and lacklebish is currently supporting a harvest objective, whereas it is not for pike. So both the current regulations which exist today will be maintained. Uh, I hope I answered your question and I hope everyone has a good night. Awesome. Thanks a lot for that, Marcel. Uh, next question tonight comes from Leo. Regarding the Lesser Slave Lake proposed management strategy for pike, how can we go from three pike over 55 centimeter limit to zero limit? Meaning it always seems the management strategies are always lagging and reactive rather than having a gradual reduction in limits. Unmuting is helpful. I uh, I, I can uh, take a swing at this, Alyssa, and, and I certainly welcome any of my colleagues, Christy or Kate, on to uh, jump in if I miss something. Um, it's a great observation. This is moving from a regulation uh, that delivered an objective of uh, maximum harvest opportunity that moves to a conservation and recovery style action. Um, I think a couple of things have happened. Uh, one, there has been some management actions that occurred. So in 2008, we saw the walleye regulations change uh, to the current, what we see, one and two fish over 43. Uh, there was a desire to monitor after that just to see, is there going to be an effort shift on slave? And will that effort shift have a corresponding co uh, impact on pike populations? Following that, in 2014, there was a fairly significant shift in the province. Uh, commercial net fishing was shut down. Commercial fishing for a long period of time represented the largest uh, user group harvest of pike coming out of Lesser Slave Lake and many lakes in, uh, in uh, the Northwest here. And so with, the other, with that management action having been taken, there was a desire to see, okay, well, was that significant enough uh, to promote pike recovery that we wanted to see? So you know, when we have taken those actions, they may not always be directly uh, towards one usership or another recreational fishers. Uh, we wanted to evaluate, the, you know, action taken, evaluation period, and that's where you see in the, the graph from the presentation, we had multiple surveys. Did we see a response from that that we wanted? So, you know, 2014, that last significant change, evaluate in 2020, uh, you know, didn't see the growth and recovery we wanted okay, now we're looking at our allocation uh, ladder and we're looking at, right, well, we do need to align to these objectives. We wanna tell the story accurately in terms of what's happening. Uh, and we started to hear feedback from uh, recreational users saying, you know what, this is great. I, I am starting to see some bigger pike here. We'd like to see, uh, you know, better catch rates. And, and that obviously triggers our action. So in this case, it's a fairly stark shift uh, for sure, but, um, you know, not one without uh, sort of a chain of events behind it. Yes. And hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks for that, Miles. Uh, so our next question comes from Kyle. Will there be any more commercial fishing in the northern regions to help maintain the lakes? Hi, Kyle. I can take that one. Uh, so as many people know, commercial fishing was closed in Alberta in 2014. And currently there are no plans to reopen commercial fishing in Alberta. I hope that helps. Awesome. Short and sweet answer. Thank you, Christy. Uh, so the next we have another set of questions here uh, from two different people about Lake Whitefish and Shining Bank. So uh, from Glenn, why is the lake whitefish disappearing from Shining Bank Lake? Is it because of the overpopulation of walleye? And Andrew asks, uh, seeing the whitefish limit at Shining Bank go from 10 to zero, they feel it shows lack of management. Um, and so, so yeah, the question on lake whitefish at Shining Bank. 
Uh, thanks for the questions on Shining Bank Lake Whitefish. Uh, I'm Mike Blackburn, fisheries biologist out of Edson here. Uh, I guess I could, I'll start addressing the why are Lake Whitefish disappearing from Shining Bank, uh, whether or not it's the overpopulation of walleye. Uh, basically, what, what, what I can tell you is we've been monitoring this for 15 years now, I, I guess. So hindsight's, hindsight's a little 2020. So in able to get an idea of what's happening, we need to uh, measure trend data. Uh, when we look at the size distribution of Lake Whitefish, uh, not only are the number have the numbers been going down uh, steadily over time, uh, but we're we're not seeing any of the smaller like whitefish. So why are they disappearing? I I, I don't know exactly why they're disappearing. Uh, the problem is recruitment. We're not seeing baby fish, and uh, as we get fewer and fewer adults, it, it's like your bank account. We get fewer and fewer baby fish. So uh, that that is the problem. What the mechanism of the problem is, we're not sure yet. Uh, whether or not it's overpopulation of walleye. Um, I guess that's a question. Uh, the, the Lake Whitefish population was, was, now that we look at it, we could see that it was declining uh, well before we had that many uh, walleye in the lake. Uh, the walleye in Shining Bank Lake are, are, are likely not overpopulated right now. They're, they're probably kind of a middle of a road population. Um, uh, same thing prior to uh, the last 10 years, uh, Northern Pike were in high densities in that lake. And so uh, we kind of see kind of a flip-flopping uh, of the different fish species throughout time. Uh, ideally, with regards to the showing of lack of management, uh, going from 10 to zero, provincially we manage Lake Whitefish with the, with the standard or I guess the, the default regulation of, of 10 any size. Currently, we don't have a, uh, a Lake Whitefish um, FSI, so to speak, like the walleye and pike. We, we are looking to set it up to, to develop thresholds and stuff so that we can uh, be less reactive and more proactive and have kind of standardized ways of, of managing these fisheries. Um, with regards to something like, like this right now, uh, because we're using standardized methods and we're able to see the trend data, we could actually, we, we, we can make those decisions right now. Uh, however, we don't have those those threshold points right now, uh, like we do for say walleye and pike. And the other thing with Lake Whitefish at Shining Bank is uh, we don't see a lot of people angling them anymore, so we're not getting that the the angler report saying things like uh, Lake Whitefish are are really bad or they're not catching there. With regards to when we uh, to Smoke Lake is another one. Uh, I'm not sure if Adrian wants to answer that one or not. Uh, but I, I believe things are, are very similar at uh, Smoke Lake with regards to those questions. Yeah, a nice baton pass there, Mike. So I, I will jump in a little bit um, before I get into the smoke. Uh, the Smoke Lake piece is, um, is Mike mentioned the FSI and we're not quite there at the Lake Whitefish and some of you folks might, why not? Why aren't you, why aren't some of these FSIs completed? You have to understand some of these FSIs take years to develop and we try to prioritize across what anglers tell us is some of their priority species. You know, walleye, pike, grayling, bull trout, West Lope cuts, Athabasca rainbows, these are the fish that have been up front and they can take a couple of years to really put these pieces together. Now transitioning on, that's kind of the why not at the FSI, but Mike is right. We have trend data right now and we are actively acting on trend data. I closed uh, and uh, ratcheted back to harvest the Lake Whitefish back in 2016 because I saw similar trends. Um, you know, trying to be transparent or decision making, we really like to have these FSIs, our policies put together. So we're, we're clear as we make these decisions as some of the criticisms has come to us over the decades of fish and wildlife. Now, moving into smoke, smoke specific to Lake Whitefish, there was a bit of a holdover as, um, uh, as the commercial fishery industry ended. We did see a large decline through that industry. Now, you got you, you to gotta acknowledge fisheries management isn't just about counting the fish. It's also managing the people, the industries, and a number of different expectations that come upon us. So it, um, it might be too, slim, too simplistic to say, why didn't we act, pull the rig? There is a number of different factors that we're juggling when we're making those decisions. And I tried to lay out a few of them at the beginning of this talk. Um, so thanks. And at this point in time, I'll hand it back to Lisa. Awesome, thank you Mike and Adrian for, for that joint answer there. 
Uh, our next question, uh, that we've got another two questions that have a similar theme. The first comes from Brian. When lakes in the Northeast were being closed to harvest over 20 years ago, we were told it would take seven years to recover to acceptable limits. Touchwood, for example, has now been closed for harvest for over 20 years. That does not indicate that a closure recovery program works effectively. Can you explain this? The second question is from Cody, uh, who asks, could you please give us some insight on why lakes like Touch, Touchwood, Pinehurst, and Amisk have been closed for so long? Uh, would opening some more popular lakes take the pressure off the very few that are open? Okay, those are two great questions and they are, uh, they are somewhat uh, related. So um, I will start with the first question, which was um, uh, some of our fisheries haven't been uh, reopened to harvest, uh, particularly walleye uh, in, in, in decades. Um, and so um, the, the seven year uh, recovery, um, that number seven years, that's about average for uh, age at first maturity and, and when we would start to see uh, 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 reproduction. So that, that seven years is, um, it's just, a, it's a standard, uh, a standard uh, life cycle um, stage. Uh, so it takes about seven years for us to see a, uh, a, a response in the population. If we don't see anything after seven years then um, we're likely looking at some other factors uh, that may be uh, pre preventing recovery. So uh, like, like Touchwood Lake, for example, is uh, it's been closed to harvest of walleye for uh, 20, going on 25 years. And so it would be, um, uh, yeah, so many seven, <laughs> that's like 20, yeah, three generations, let's say, and we still haven't seen um, a, a big increase. So obviously there's something else going on. It's not just, uh, so we're not recovering the population uh, by not harvesting them. So maybe something else is happening. Um, and Touchwood Lakes specifically, uh, we've got evidence of recruitment failure. There are gaps in age classes. Um, uh, Touchwood Lake is not a, uh, uh, not a typical walleye fishery that we have in, in the Northwest. So uh, it's, um, it's got lower productivity um, and it just uh, has a lower carrying capacity. Um, so not all of our fisheries actually uh, fit that, um, that uh, uh, not all not all of our fisheries are really good walleye fisheries. Um, so that seven year uh, recovery uh, would probably apply more to um, you know our, our, our good walleye fisheries. Some of our fisheries aren't good walleye fisheries, and uh, to recover them takes um, more uh, more sacrifice, um, more um, more uh, more regulation. Um, and some, some of these fisheries, we might not be able to recover because they, um, uh, because there's so, there are very many compounding factors. Um, so the second part of the question um, about, uh, yeah, so we're talking, actually, Alyssa, would you uh, re uh, repeat that second question for me, please? Absolutely. Um... Thanks. So could you please give us some insight on why lakes like Touchwood, Pinehurst, and Amisk have been closed for so long? Uh, would yeah. opening some more popular lakes take the pressure off the few that are open? For sure. Okay. So yeah, so that's r related. So I'm, I'm not as uh, familiar with Amisk. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, uh, with the other two lakes. So Pinehurst um, has been uh, off and on. We've had harvest. Um, but again, it's a really popular lake, um, lower productivity, but um, uh, it is uh, vulnerable to, to over harvest. Uh, and so uh, in order to balance that vulnerability um, and uh, allow some harvest, we've got tags on it. Um, a, a lake like Touchwood, uh, putting tags on probably won't recover it. We're already trying, uh, like we, uh, it's catch and release for, for walleye and it's still not recovering. So. Um, in order to recover that population, we may need to look at more drastic measures, which um, could uh, could include 
um, like a, a wholesale closure like was done in, in, in Pembina. And I'm not, I'm not recommending or suggesting that. I'm just saying these are, uh, these are kind of, you know, the next steps that we'd be looking at to recover a, a fishery uh, like that. Um, uh, I'll uh, hand off to uh, Marcel because he's got uh, more, uh, more knowledge about AMIS. Yeah, so uh, I can explain AMISC. So AMISC has a, a long history of, it was open and collapsed. It was open and collapsed. And there was a couple of different traditional regulations that were used uh, specifically with walleye. That happened, it keep having this repeated pattern. So we were trying to find something where it didn't keep going into that pattern. So we tried a special harvest license. So walleye harvest is open there. Uh, it isn't closed, uh, and it's been that way for a while. And it's the one regulation we we've, uh, we've had over the past about 15 years, where it hasn't been in that uh, that constant cycle of open, closed, open, closed. It's been open. It's stayed successfully open, and it's allowing walleye harvest. Amisk is also quite uh, habitat limited. It is quite anoxic in places. So even though it's quite a large lake, it's fairly anoxic. So there's certain times of the year where all the fish are crowded into that oxygen rich area. So it seems like there's a really abundant population of walleye and they're doing well, but a lot of that lake is anoxic. So it's not quite as great as it seems. But that said, that's why we use special harvest license and it's worked successfully. So I hope that helps answer your question with Amisk. And just to, to follow up, because uh, the last part of that question was, why don't we open up uh, all of the lakes? to kind of spread the pressure around? Um, that's a that's a, a great question. And um, uh, that's a, a common question that we get. Um, and we have looked at that. Um, uh, it, the, um, the, the, the fact is that uh, we just, we don't have enough um, uh, uh, sustainable or stable fisheries to, uh, to, uh, to meet that demand. Um, where we could just open everything up. Um, the, some of our fisheries uh, may may suffer. Uh, some some may not. Um, so um, uh, we're uh, we're we're very careful uh, about um, um, effort response, and we understand effort response. Uh, so when we make a regulation change, we we understand that. Um, anglers are going to get excited and, and um, go uh, visit that fishery and, and, and effort can really impact uh, a single fishery. It'd be great if we could spread that out, um, but uh, we, uh, uh, we don't have, a, uh, we just don't have a, a lot of sustainable fisheries available to, to provide uh, that, um, that broad of an opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Duane and Marcel, for the answer to that question. A lot of good information there. Uh, our next question comes from Keith. Is, there, is any consideration being put into the perch populations? All right, Keith, I'm going to take a crack at that one. Um, so there's a long and short answer. The, the short answer is yes. Um, and I'll try to build the long answer. So since the early 2000s, <clears throat> we've adopted uh, standard netting protocols. And each time we sink a net, we collect data on every fish, every fish species, baby, small, big, we collect that data and it goes into a database. Uh, now being honest, and, and, and it's hard to do so sometimes, is perch scare us. Perch management is something that's not straightforward. They're cyclical. There can be a huge number of perch in a system, but they're all three inches long and spawning quite happily. Or you can have perch break out into like the big pan fryers. You know, the one pound perch, the ones that cause the internet to go crazy and all of a sudden the anglers shift from one population or one uh, water body to another. Perch anglers are quite dedicated and we're hearing that loud and clear over the last number of years. So are we considering it? Yes, we're actually currently in the background through our policy division um, working on a perch FSI. Uh, using all of that data that we've collected, what, 2021, 18, 15 to 18 years worth of data. So we have a database and a pool to start to work with to look at what that population, not just at a lake wise, but across the province might look like and ensure that when we manage it, we manage it consistently across that province. Um, I hope that answers the question, both long and short. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, our next question comes from Ian. It was previously discussed stocking perch in lakes to diversify fishing opportunities. Lakes such as Mizawawi near Laklabish, where, where are we at on this strategy? 
I can take that one. Thank you, Alyssa, and thanks, Ian, for the question. Um, you know, we Ian, we hear this question quite a bit about uh, you know north, uh, yellow perch fishing in the Northeast, and what are some things we can do to improve that? You're right. We've talked about uh, in the past you know, couple of years looking for locations where we can add, uh, stock uh, yellow perch and where they'll be able to overwinter. Many of the, the places that we have that might be available, like Misawawi, they haven't been overwintering successfully. And so we haven't stocked in there. But other places like uh, Thunder Lake, we, we did a small transfer this year. We have been uh, you know, doing those where we can. You know, if there are ideas that you have you know, for in that Lacklebish area, please reach out to us. There may be, you know, water bodies we're not aware of or some ideas that you have. We'd be really glad to hear those too as we kind of work towards this. So thank you. Appreciate the question. I'm going to follow up with Jordan here. Uh, so from the Northwest, um, Jordan is speaking of some lakes in the Northeast. And in the Northwest, we had two lakes that had perch transfers last year. So something to know about perch transfers and fish transfers in general, it takes a lot of planning. So Jordan mentioned making sure they can overwinter. So making sure those fish are available for fishing opportunity in the future. Um, so it takes a little bit of planning to get these projects going, but we got two recently stocked. We're just waiting to see what happens with those transfers to see if those fish survive. Uh, so one is Blue Lake, south of High Prairie. Fish were moved into there last year, as well as Mitsu Lake near the town of Slave Lake. So with a little bit of luck and effort, we're going to go out and see what those perch are doing here in the coming years. So slowly but surely, we're, we're getting those plans into action. Awesome. Thanks both Jordan and Christy for that answer. Appreciate it. Uh, next question comes from Daryl. Can you give an expected breakdown based on sex for the three harvest options for walleye for Lesser Slave Lake? I can take a run at this one. Uh, Daryl, thank you very much for the question. Uh, <laughs> definitely harder for me to uh, to do with purely words. So I will try to do myself, uh, do the question justice. Uh, please follow up with me afterwards though, as well. Um, uh, so what I can say uh, with the 2020 survey that we saw for Lester Slave Lake, uh, the sex ratio, so the, the number of males to females in the survey, uh, is pretty close to 50-50. Uh, it changes a little bit by basin. It's 60-40 in the west. It's 55-45 in the east for males to females. So it's relatively similar. Uh, advantageously, we see uh, very little difference in terms of the size structure of males and females between the two basins. So right now, it doesn't look like the existing uh, regulations or any harvest regime has said more males or more females are leaving because of a regulation. Uh, so when we look at the three options, fish over 50, fish 45 to 50, and fish 50 to 55, uh, males and females do have a little bit of difference in terms of things like growth and when they reach maturity for the first time. Males tend to mature faster than uh, females when it comes to fish. Uh, and walleye and slave lake, we see that as true. So the males will grow quick till about age five, six when they start maturing. Uh, and then their growth will begin to sort of slow down. Females might grow faster until age sort of six to eight where their, their growth begins to slow down. Uh, and so in the uh, 45 to 50 slot, I would expect that there will be very little difference in the consequence of that on uh, selective harvest of females or males. Uh, in fish over 50, uh, the females may reach 50 first. And so there could be uh, a selection effect that happens there. Uh, given the size of the lake, so you know we're sitting on about 119,000 square hectares of, of water, uh, there is likely to be large chunks of the lake that will be unfished at any one time. So I, I, if we were dealing with a smaller water body, uh, we might see that effect really pronounced. In Lesser Slave Lake, I don't think we would see harvest at a level um, that might start to skew uh, sex ratios based on size and growth. Uh, in 50 to 55 for that slot limit, um, again, I think the uh, females will probably get in there uh, first, but we are seeing males growing out, uh, you know, to uh, well over 55 centimeters. So there is every opportunity for them to both enter and leave the slot. Uh, 
And then in terms of fish over 50, it would present the probably the most just as the minimum size limit, uh, sort of balanced opportunity for harvest over that size limit. Um, with words, and I am a fan of graphs, uh, uh, that is that is hopefully what I can do uh, for folks with without really digging in with you know coefficients and things like that. But again, please follow up with me after if, you, if you'd like more information there. Excellent. And maybe I'll just end with it saying those growth pieces as well. We talked about slave, but uh, I think Dwayne and Marcel, Adrian, others have mentioned this, this can have you know big changes between lakes. So I'm, I'm using some values that come from slave data. Uh, ages, sizes can be younger or earlier, depending on if you're in Lethbridge, if you're in Peace River or high level. So there is variability within the species as well. Rarely do we see any reg that will act like it's over. Awesome. Thanks, Miles. Uh, next question is from Grant. On Slave Lake, why is there no habitat enhancement on Mitsu Creek and Muskeg Creek for pike spawning? As they are the main spawning areas for pike and you are trying to reduce the fishery. Hey Grant, um, I'm gonna try to start answering that one and then I'll ask my colleague Miles to jump in as well. Uh, so thanks for the question, Grant. Um, the, the areas that you're talking about, so the creeks for those that are maybe unfamiliar with the area, our downstream uh, tributaries of the Lesser Slave River. Um, there's been a lot of water alterations in the Lesser Slave River over the past decade. So we've seen a little bit of change in flows. Um, we've also seen how fish use those different tributaries changing over time. So over the last few years, there have been different suggestions um, to take a closer look at how fish are specifically using those tributaries and what could possibly be done as far as water movement goes. Um, as part of our work that we were doing on the Lesser Slave River over the last couple of years, we were able to do some closer investigations, uh, the fish populations in the Lesser Slave River, taking a look at what those populations look like. We've done those surveys earlier in the summer, so maybe not catching the full spring pike migration, but seeing how pike are moving in there. Um, I would definitely be interested to have further conversations with you, Grant, because I know you know the area very well and be curious to hear your thoughts on um, how pike are using those areas based on your observations. Miles, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, maybe just one or two points. And, uh, I, you know, first I'll reinforce what Christy just said, which is I, I think we would be very happy to discuss any ideas that folks have uh, about these kinds of things. Uh, we're here today because we want feedback from the public on uh, what actions can we take and how can we uh, solve these problems together. Uh, we're probably never going to say no to a good, uh, you know, project idea like that, right, where enhancement can help. Um, with respect to the change in the regulation, so, if, you know, going from 3 over 55 to 0 as, as catch and release, uh, zero retention, uh, I, would, I would describe it as sort of a triaged approach where, if we thought about this as a budget and our objective is to save money, uh, one of the first actions we can take is spend less. And that's, you know, that is what the uh, three fish to zero fish for retention limits uh, gives us. It's not uh, intended to be a permanent fix. It is a first action we can take. Something like a habitat enhancement project, like you described, that is almost a second source of income. So if we want to grow the bank account faster, it is, well, how can we ensure that every pike that's going out there and laying eggs and trying to spawn uh, has can contribute has that opportunity of, of knowing that mother nature uh, you know can can weigh in at times uh, and impact that but uh, projects like that assist in that if we looked at slave as a water body there there are other uh, tributary systems where as you said Mitsu Creek uh, important for pike important for pike to get in there uh, we know that there from some habitat and spawning work done in uh, the mid 1990s there are pike that will go up a couple of the other tributary systems. And, you know, Slave is somewhat fortunate. We have about 240 kilometers of shoreline, uh, and there's big stretches of that where we have the aquatic emergent vegetation that pike will use. So there are places like uh, OJ Bay and Foss Bay uh, as well that will support some in-lake spawning. Uh, so we do have some of those contributors happening now and uh, building on that triage approach of uh, spend less, save more. Uh, still happy to look at things like let's let's do some good work in uh, Mitsu Creek. Let's think about how we can get some of these other income sources online and shrink the time uh, so we can get back to the opportunity for harvest. 
Excellent. Thank you for that. And just looking at the time here, uh, this will be our last question for the evening. We have time for one more quick one uh, before we share a bit of information and then close out. The question comes from Dave. David, how concerned should we be about the fish population at Slave Lake? Years of overfishing seems to have reduced the stock. I can, uh, I'll give Miles and Christy just a slight break there. They're welcome to jump in here, Alyssa. Um, yeah, David asked this question a little bit earlier and thanks, David. It, it might've been addressed through some of the previous questions through Miles' uh, through Miles's presentation. And, I, you know, I, when we think about it and and uh, Lesser Slave Lake, it, it's our largest fishery in the province. We add together uh, indigenous uh, use, recreational use, competitive use, other uses on Lesser Slave Lake. Um, it, it's a large fishery. Uh, the advantage and Miles just kind of stated it um, it's its size. Um, it's certainly to its advantage. So, you know, I, I guess David and, and all, I, I don't know that I would use the word concern. Uh, I think this presents an opportunity and I think Miles and Christy and I have talked about it, use that word, which is, you know, when we think about keeping that objective of sustainable harvest, which is uh, a lot of what Lesser Slave Lake gets used for, how people come and, and they're looking for a place in the province uh, for those harvest opportunities, is we wanna ensure that we can maintain that. Um, is this an opportunity to reflect on what some of those current pressures are, you know, provide some resiliency so that that can be maintained going in the you know going forward. I think this is an opportunity for that. Um, you know, with with options that um, you know recalibrate us, if you will, to keeping on that trajectory of harvest opportunities going forward, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It'll continue to get high use. I, I've been on the boat launch at Jusard and Canyon and and um, and Hilliards, uh, grumbling uh, with with all of you at times and. Um, you know, we, we want folks to continue to use that fishery. I think this is an opportunity to, again, continue to allow us to do that. Uh, Miles spoke on the pike piece. Um, I, I, again, by making, you know, by evaluating the one management objective, seeing that um, that wasn't necessarily achieving what our goals were. And, and I think the goals of, of, of our users out there that you know, provided, you know, feedback of dissatisfaction with that. And so this is an opportunity to use a different objective. Um, I, I think, you know, we've answered that question, Miles, great job, you know, in regards to why the change on Pike. Uh, again, I think the size of Slave Lake, et cetera, um, the information getting out there to anglers, I think that puts us in a position to, to see recovery, I, I hope quite quickly on Lesser Slave Lake and get back to providing, uh, you know, more options, opportunities, et cetera, for the public going forward. So um, I'm gonna, I'm I'm going to be quiet now, Alyssa. I, I do want to thank everybody for the questions. We, we didn't get to all of them tonight, and I really encourage folks to reach out if you're if you're holding that question. Uh, ask the same question on the phone to any of our staff here tonight, myself, uh, or through an email, etc. We we do want to hear from you. We we uh, we want to hear from you all year long uh, on some of these pieces. So so please uh, continue to share those. So back to you, Alyssa. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Tadon. Uh, and with that, we're at the end of our question and answer session. Thank you to our viewers for the excellent questions and to all panelists for your thoughtful answers this evening. Uh, before we bid you good night, I have a few quick items to share with you. So I'm just gonna share my screen here very quickly. Uh, yes. Okay, the first, more opportunities to get involved in our currently open uh, sport fishing regulation engagement. Please go have a look at our engagement webpage on alberta.ca. Uh, there you can find access to a survey about the items for consultation for this year. We're looking for your feedback through that survey by February 7th at noon. Uh, and ask the expert features also accessible on that engagement webpage. If we didn't get to your question tonight or another question comes to mind following the session, please check out the Ask the Expert where, where we'll be responding to submissions received there through the duration of the sport fishing engagement. There's also a series of fact sheets on the web on the web page. Uh, there you can find more information about every water body being discussed in this year's engagement. Uh, if you're free next Wednesday night and interested in learning about provincial fisheries and sport fishing updates, like the proposed approach to protecting fish during periods of low flow and high temperatures, harvest slot limits, electronic special harvest license tags, the walleye stocking program, competitive fishing events legislation, and angling guide licensing, please join us for that webinar. You can register on the engagement webpage. My Wild Alberta is where you can turn for information on all things fishing. You can follow My Wild Alberta on Facebook or find more information on its website, or of course, always on alberta.ca. Uh, family Fishing Weekend is coming up in February on the 19th to 21st. Uh, sport fishing license is now required in Alberta to fish on that weekend, so it's a great opportunity for new anglers to give ice fishing a try. 
Finally, when you exit Zoom tonight, you'll be offered the opportunity to answer a few questions regarding this session. Please do take the time to fill that out if you can. Uh, your feedback helps to continually improve, um, us to continually improve, improve and ensure that we're meeting your needs. So that's very important to us. We really value that feedback. Uh, and finally, on behalf of our presenters, panel, and behind the scenes team, thank you for taking the time out of your busy week to spend with us. Have a lovely evening, and we hope to see you at our other session. Uh, we